when you're cooking wild game, if if you've been the only person involved in that process from the time that animal was alive and then processed and then deep freeze and then back to your charcoal and then onto the table, yeah, it doesn't matter if if technically you've ruined it once you're eating it. You're like, man, that's the best thing I've ever eaten. <laughs> yeah. everybody this is jason hamlet and you are listening to the i hunt podcast the i hunt podcast is dedicated to bringing you guests from all over this great country who share the same passion as you do the great outdoors and more precisely hunting and fishing our guests will range from experts to people just like you and me each of whom will be able to provide us personal insight into the tactics and strategies they use in their neck of the woods. From hooks, hooves, wings, and webs, we will cover it all. As always, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. And don't forget to rate and review. That means a lot. Thanks for listening, and let's get to the show. Hey, everybody, what's up? This is the I Hunt Podcast, episode number 012, Processing Wild Game with my good friend, Don Pratt. It's very, very, very important to learn how to process your own game meat. Uh, as Don explains, there are a lot of things that could go wrong if you take your animal to a local processing center and have them process it for you. There's a lot of things that uh, can happen to have your, your meat treated poorly that can lead to some uh, some not-so-great dining experience and not so great tasting meat. So the best way to make sure that animal is handled properly all the way through the process is to do it yourself. And I know it seems like an intimidating process, trust me. I was pretty intimidated when I first got into it, but now, you know, I've done a few animals and it's the only thing I know is to do it myself. You, It's just such a rewarding experience to, um, to, to have that food on the plate serving your family. You know that you were the only person that had your hands on that animal through the entire process, it's not as intimidating as it seems. You know, uh, once you get out, get the uh, get the basics down, uh, which kind of Don kind of goes over with us in this episode, and then it's just a matter of of what to do with that meat once once you have it broke down. So what we, me and Don, kind of do in this episode is we go through a uh, a situation where we have a white-tailed deer, quote unquote, hanging in our garage. We break down that animal from each section. And go over what types of cuts you can expect to get out of each section, each section of that animal, and then go over some basic preparations on how to elevate that game to really impress your dinner guests or your family, and just to make for a much better overall experience with eating that wild game, and to uh, maybe take yourself to step outside of your comfort zone a little bit and step outside the box and do some things with your wild game that you're not necessarily doing and uh, you're not necessarily used to doing. To help us all grow as hunters and uh, grow as cookers, cookers, as grow as chefs and, uh, you know, just have an all, all around better experience uh, once we harvest that deer in the fall this year. So uh, I hope you guys learn a lot. I'm confident you will. If you notice, uh, my voice probably doesn't sound so great today. Uh, I'm feeling a little bit under the weather, so I'm going to try to make this intro quick so you guys don't have to listen to my sick-sounding voice for, for too much longer. Well, you know, uh, we're kind of in between seasons right now. Not a whole lot of hunting going here on here in Ohio, but it uh, doesn't mean you got to be sitting on your ass and doing nothing. Uh, so one of the things that I've kind of came up with, and with my help, with the help of one of my good friends, uh, Jake Franklin at One Ten Sparky on Twitter, uh, we've came up with a little competition between the both of us, a little challenge uh, to where we're each going to go out over the next five weeks and cold knock five different uh, properties to try to get some permission to hunt some new land. So if you're out there and your 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 uh, off season's flying by and you're not really doing much to get prepared for the deer season, first off you're behind the eight ball. But second off, you know let's let's take these months and and, and do something with them. You know if you're not planting food plots, if you're uh, I'm sure you got trail cameras out running on some properties you're hunting now. But hey, why not take the chance and try to find some new ground? 
you know, it, seem, it can seem like an impossible feat trying to find new land, but uh, one good way of doing that is to get out and to cold knock some doors. You never know who's going to say yes, who's going to say no. I personally have never done it, so uh, this is going to be kind of a learning experience for me. So if, if you feel a little encouraged to get out and knock some doors, I encourage you to uh, let me know on Twitter. Let me know how it's going. Use the hashtag GainingGround2017 so uh, everybody who's interested can follow along with you. And uh, I'll definitely keep you guys posted on how my search is going. I got my first property picked out. I'll be hitting them up this weekend. And at the end of this five weeks, me and Jake are going to sit down and have a podcast and kind of talk about what we learned, what went right, what went, right, what went wrong, and uh, let you guys know if we managed to find any new property out of it. Uh, you never know. You know, somebody could say yes, and that property could hold a monster of a buck that you end up getting down this year. And uh, the, the, the seeds for that hunt would have been planted right here in June. So uh, get out, knock some doors. Let us know how it's going. Other thing I wanted to mention to you guys before we get this podcast rolling is uh, another one of my buddies, Steve Henson on, uh, from Sentinel Decoys, is giving away another one of his decoys this month. Uh, just go to his Twitter his Twitter feed, uh, Steven Henson 5 Check out his pinned tweet, and it has a video of his, de- his three-headed decoy. If you haven't seen it before... Definitely check it out, but also if you retweet that tweet, it enters you in for a contest to win one of those for free, and uh, trust me, they're well worth it. I just got mine in last week, and I set it up, and I was amazed with how awesome it looked and how great it looked, and I actually had a, there's a doe that fawns in my neighbor's backyard every year, and um, she fawned again this year back there, and uh, right as I got done setting up this uh this decoy, she's at the fence stomping, staring at it. I thought she was going to jump the fence and come after me. <laughs> so it fooled her. Uh, I can't wait to get it out into the uh, field and see what and see what kind of deer it brings in. But check him out on Twitter. Uh, like I said, retweet that tweet and it enters, enters you in for free. Uh, I think you got to do it by June 9th, 9th, June 19th. So you got a few days to, to find him on Twitter and retweet that tweet and they get entered into his contest. All right, uh, that's pretty much it. I'm just going to throw out some sponsors real quick, guys. The podcast is growing. Uh, I I love doing this for you guys. My end-all goal is hopefully to to get out of the rat race and not have to work that 9-to-5 job anymore and get to do this full-time for you guys. In order for that to happen, I need some help from you guys. I need you guys to uh, check out some of my sponsors, Um, one of them being Amazon.com. You know you can find anything your little heart desires on Amazon. You're probably out there buying it. You're probably already looking for stuff uh, for the deer hunting season. If you're buying new trail cameras, if you're buying some new bow, a bow, if you're buying arrows, you know, whatever it is you're buying for your hunting and fishing needs, you can find it on Amazon.com. And if you happen to listen to my last episode about muskie fishing with Luke Veek, Luke actually spelled out a lot of uh, great, great equipment that you would need if you decide to go out and chase some muskie. Find a lot of that equipment at, on Amazon.com as well. And uh, I would just encourage you, if you're looking to make any purchase through Amazon, to just please go to my website, www.theihuntpodcast.com, and click on my Amazon link before you uh, make your purchase. And then you can just go to Amazon and shop like you normally would after after following that link. What that does, it gives me a little bit of kickback for the show to help uh, kick a little bit of money towards the show so I can maybe get a little better audio for you guys so I can start planning some some more trips to, to have some in, uh, in-studio in interviews and some, some great content. So yeah, check it out. Follow that link. Anything you buy through that link, it definitely helps out the show a lot. Also uh, brought to you by Audible. Audible.com. It's, uh, I also have a link for Audible on my website as well, www.bihuntpodcast.com. And following that link, it will get you a free 30-day trial. Uh, just go on, sign up, and you get to uh, access to a, a ton of great information through books on tape, essentially. It has some great narrators who read these books for you, and you can uh, take in a lot of great information on driving on, driving on your car. Or going around the house doing some yard work or doing some dishes, whatever it is you're doing, you can uh, get in some great info through audible.com. Like I said, it's a free 30-day trial. If you decide to stick on after that 30 days, great. If not, that's fine too. Uh, just just for you sign up for the free 30 days, that costs no money to you. It actually helps out the show and gives me a little bit of a kickback and a little bit of commission. So 
If you want to support the show, those are two ways you can do it. Uh, I surely do appreciate it. Uh, I, I love doing this for you guys and love bringing you content. If you want to show your support, that's one way to do it. That's it, guys. Uh, aside from that, you know, share share the show if you like it. Uh, share it with your friends. Share it on Twitter. I do appreciate it. Let's get on with the show. Without further ado, I bring you my good buddy, Don Pratt. Enjoy. What's up, buddy? What's going on, Don? Can you hear me all right? I can hear you fine. How can you hear me? Good. Good, 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 good. So how is your weekend going, man? It's going really good. I uh, I played hooky from work on Friday, so I started early. Ah, you bastard. You got a three-day weekend, huh? <laughs> I did. I figured, you know what? I deserve it. <laughs> oh. Did you get anything accomplished with your three-day weekend? Um, not really. Mowed the grass. Did some stuff around the house, but, you I, know, I, um, I, I caught a, I caught some whole basket full of viruses about a month ago. And, uh, I mean, mono being one of them. And, uh, this put me on my ass for like two weeks. And the doctors were like, uh, they made the statement that, you know, you could be down for several months or more than a year, what? you know, with mono. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. And so, um, my actual, my first degree is in fitness and uh, nutrition. That's how I met my wife. And uh, I was like, you know what? I'm going to beat it. So I spent the next three weeks just doing everything perfect and went back for another blood test. And they're like, no, it's weird. We've never seen this. All your blood work looks normal. And so, you know, I'm I'm back in the saddle. I mean, I lost almost 20 pounds, but, you know, I'm back at it. And uh, but what I was going to say is since I got that diagnosis, um, the doctor literally wrote a note to my employer saying, you know, anytime he says he needs to stay home, he needs to stay home. <laughs> I'm like, Sweet. Get out of jail free card. And I'm, and I'm on salary, so I'm like, all right. No kidding. I'm like, ah, oh, I'd love to, but I'm feeling kind of tired today. <laughs> now, what did you do to, what did you do to whip, uh, mono so quick? What, what, what kind of life changes did you make or what you do? Well, it's, what it does is, um, it, it attacks your red blood cells and it makes you weak. And then your liver has to process out those red blood cells. So your liver gets inflamed and then your spleen has to make new red blood cells. So it gets swollen. And so you can't work it out or anything because you could get bumped and your spleen could rupture. So um, just tons of different kind of herbs that help to um, rebuild your, your red blood cells. And like things like milk thistle will help um, – uh, regulate your liver enzymes, you know, just that sort of stuff. And, uh, you know, men aren't typically supposed to take iron, but I took a little bit of iron because of us, my blood cell count was going to be low, but, um, just a lot of that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, I was, like I said, I was, I was on my ass for about two weeks and then, uh, oh, and also quit drinking beer or quit drinking any kind of alcohol and I love booze, but so quit that and then, uh, was sleep, was sleeping about 12 hours a night. And then, uh, after about a week of that, I found myself getting up before my alarm went off, you know, plenty of energy and, uh, and, you know, my doc, you're going to work. Yeah, I, I feel fine. And so they wanted me to come in for more blood tests. They're like, yeah, all right, well, everything looks normal. Weirdest thing. <laughs> now, in the mono, it's more like a, like I've heard it described, isn't it just make you feel like ran down and tired the whole time? Or is there other symptoms that come along with it? Well, um, I just, like in your neck and your armpits and your groin. You get like a robust sore throat, but yeah, uh, the body, imagine the worst body aches you've ever had when you had the flu, uh -huh. it's that times five. It, it's, it's like the body aches when you get the flu super bad, you know, mm -hmm. that combined with just being completely wiped out where you can't even get off, you can't even get out of bed. All right. And that mono, it, uh, I saw on your Twitter feed, it hit you right in the middle of turkey season, but I don't think it saved it. It managed to save any turkey's lives. You seem to hit them pretty good. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, I managed to get my wife on two birds and then, uh, I got a bird and then I was down for about a month. I made it out a couple of times, but I just wasn't in it. And then, uh, I didn't post about it anywhere, but I shot a bird on the last day of our season. I don't know if I told you or not, but, um, Age-wise, it was an old, old bird. It had a 12-inch beard and had one spur completely broken off, but one spur was about an inch and a half long. And, uh, yeah, the way he was behaving, you could tell that probably last year he was he was probably the big boss Tom on the property. But this year, I think he, he was on the downslide, so he, he wasn't as heavy as some of his counterparts. Wow. How old do you think he and was? He, 
Um, at least four years old. Wow. And uh, he'd been through some battles. He was pretty beat up. I mean, if I don't know, cause, you know, hunters and fishermen, they always tell stories, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if he was five. By the way he was behaving, the size of the spurs, you know, just all around. He looked like he'd probably been, you know, one of the big boss toms. And then uh, this year, um, some of the the younger toms or maybe even groups of jakes had probably been beating him up pretty bad because right when he was about to come to me, there was a gobble off behind me, and he instantly dropped his feathers and hightailed it the opposite direction and mm. uh, never never gobbled, and he never, ever gobbled one single time because when he gobbles, obviously then the other other male birds will be able to hear where he is and they'll come with yeah, it sounds like that. But it, I did, I, yeah, I had to completely change my tactic and just set up on where I figured he would come out the next morning, and that's what happened. Awesome. So you got two and your wife got two then this year. That's it, yeah. That's a pretty good season. Now, now, how do you – is there is there an effective way to go about uh, Asian a turkey? Or, like, I know deer, you're going through the the, the the teeth and all that, but, I mean, what's, what's the method for Asian a turkey? Or is there one? Um, well – um, definitely the spurs, and you can even, I, I think I've done it before. I think you can go online and look at the age of different birds compared to their spur length. And, um, obviously a one year old Jake has just little tiny bumps. And then, uh, a two year old bird, you know, may have, you know, a half inch little black spur that's not even pointed. It's still kind of rounded. And then a three year old bird has got probably black spurs, you know, three quarters uh, to a, you know, close to an inch long and they're pointed. And beyond that, you start getting an inch and a quarter, inch and a half, and they start to become kind of ivory colored. And I mean, they're, they're more bone like. Now, yeah. I imagine it is it's like deer. Uh, once you probably get past like the three, four year old market, probably it kind of muddies the water to tell their age after that. Kind of like deer. Once you get over that five year mark, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's anybody's best guess if that's yeah. five or seven or eight or. Yeah. And with, with turkeys though, is, yeah, you know, they after about three or four years old, they really start to drop off. Um, I did shoot a bird a couple of years ago. I don't know how old he was. He had humongous spurs, but I thought he was a jake. He was so small and scrawny. So I think what happens is, uh, you know, once they crest that four year mark, I think uh, uh, the up and coming birds pretty much run them out. Don't let them eat. Don't let them breed. Beat them up every chance they get. And so I think. You're not. I don't think anyone's ever going to find a bird over five years old in the wild. Yeah, you're. Uh, I'm sure that bird you just shot. You'll be saying it's six, it was six years old a year from now. So <laughs> I will. <laughs> I get older every time I tell the story. <laughs> yeah, that's a, nature's a bitch, man. Those, I mean, they just they don't. Those younger birds, they don't take no prisoners when it comes to <clears throat> like once once they smell weakness, once they smell something going over yeah. the hill, it's just they just are all over them. And they run in groups. You know, Jake's run in mobs of, you know, two, three, four, five, six, ten birds. And no matter how strong you are as a Tom, you got five Jake's gang up on you and you're going to get your ass whipped. Yeah. Um, oh, I didn't, I know I, I, you're the turkey man. I didn't bring you on here to tur- tur- talk turkey today. We actually, uh, you're going mm-hmm. to, to, uh, elevate our wild game cooking today for us. So uh, you had an extra day off work. So I know you've, you've probably been preparing for this and probably got a lot of, a lot of good information for us. 100% off the cuff. Let's go wing it. <laughs> that makes two of us. I, I typically do uh, kind of have some kind of overview of how I want the conversation to go. But since two pops yeah. today, I did that with the first one, and I planned on having some time in between to write some stuff down. Yep. And I, I didn't, so we're, we're both going off the cuff here. That's all right. <laughs> it's recorded, so if it sucks, you can just delete it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, well, I guess let's uh, let's start. Let's get into talking about uh, let's, let's stick mostly for for purposes of here. We're going to take stick the hooved animals. You know, your deer, your animal. Yeah. Uh, let's say you, you get one on the ground, and what? Yeah. But before we even field dress that animal, and or as we're field dressing that animal, what is is some mistakes that are commonly made that's going to result in that game that meat being what people will classify as a gamey tasting meat? Yeah, and I like the way you put it when you said what people will classify as gamey tasting meat because when when people say, "Oh, I don't like deer because it's gamey," and that's the comment that my wife made to me when we got married 15 years ago, she's like, "Oh, I don't like." I don't like deer meat because it's gamey. And she grew up with a bunch of brothers in Wisconsin that hunted deer. And 
didn't want to eat it, and then I made her some, and she, and to this day, her and everyone else in my family, you know, that's their favorite meat. What I think has it, what has happened in the past in order to put people off of game meat is if if I go out and I shoot a deer, and you know, it's got a nice rack on it, and I'm proud of it. Uh, best case scenario, I find it very very quickly, and the weather is really really cool. But I think what's happened a lot in the past is. You know, you you shoot an animal, you know, it runs wherever it runs to, you track it, you get the deer, you throw it in the back of the truck, and you got to drive it over to a friend's house to show him, then you got to take some pictures, you got to go show your mom and dad, and next thing you know, I think it's been in your car for, or in the back of your truck for, you know, you know five, six hours, whatever, by the time you actually get down to the business of breaking it down and processing it, or worse yet, and, and I know I'll probably catch a lot of flack from this, so I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to put a caveat in here. Some of my, I have some really good friends that are meat processors. I have a real good friend that, that owns a butcher shop near the town I live in. And he does a spectacular job. That being said, their bread and butter is beef, is, you know, the cattle, the pork, you know, poultry, that sort of thing. So when deer season rolls around and um, people start showing up with deer that, you know, there's always the possibility that, that this guy over here gut shot the thing, didn't find it till the next morning, goes and drop it off at the processor, and you may have shot a deer, and as soon as you got there, you gutted it, you treated it perfectly, you took it to the processor, and they're working through their beef orders, their pork orders, whatever, and then when they have time to get to the whitetail, they start dragging them in, they gut them, they skin them, they break them down, they quarter them, and they're all piled off basically together. So by the time you pick up your deer whether it's a couple of weeks or a month, instead of getting your deer that you treated as as cleanly and as quickly as possible, it's very possible you're getting ground from this gut shot deer that waited a day to die and got driven around the back of a truck for a couple of hours. So one of the things I was going to make sure that I discussed at, uh, at, at length today in great detail was, you know, how to treat your animal once it hits the ground and how important it is to learn to break down your own animal. Yeah, I think that's I think that's very important. I mean, I uh I haven't I don't have any horror stories about game processing because, you know, I've only I've been hunting 3 years and in every animal I've shot, I've broke down myself. It's not hard. It's not something that's impossible or some big extreme feat that it's 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 made out to be at times it seems like. Like I can't imagine paying somebody to do it at this point. And, and and if I remember, I think you said you would basically watch some YouTube videos to figure out what to do. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what I did. Watch watch some YouTube videos. Uh, I obviously got I got Steve Rinella's book, the, uh, the complete guide to hunting and butchering wild game. So I mean, he has a lot yep. of tips in there, and and that's that's it. You know, got in and got my hands dirty myself. Obviously, I made some mistakes. Yep. Off. I mean, my cuts aren't the cleanest looking. They they ain't as pretty packed as uh, what you'd get from a processor, but they they eat good. <laughs> Yeah, and and you make a good point. You know, well, you said you know I may not have done it right, or I may not have been pretty, but I can tell you one thing: when you see the animal, and you're the one that makes the decision, I'm going to take this animal's life, and then I'm going to bring it home, I'm going to break it down, I'm going to package it, I'm going to put it in my deep freeze, and then I'm going to cook it. So you've been the only person touching that animal from the time it was in the field until the time it's on your children's plate, your wife's plate, or whatever. And not only is that a fantastic feeling, but you know beyond a shadow of a doubt it's been clean, you know, there's no hair in it, it it's it's been treated as perfectly as you can possibly treat it because you want the best for you and your family. And that's exactly why I do it the way I do it. Right, yeah, exactly, 100%. I 100% agree. And not not only the feeling that you get from doing it, but, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's so nice to know that you – this, it, you did it all, you know. Absolutely, yep. And to go back to your original question, uh, you know, I have a tendency to run off on these tangents, but your question about what to do once you know once the bullet leaves the gun or the arrow leaves the bow, and you're walking up on your animal. Now, the, the first things to think about is weather. If it's if it's really warm out, then you obviously you want to get it gutted and you want to get it skinned as quickly as possible. Start allowing the meat to cool down. Because heat is definitely your enemy in this situation. So, um, if, if you're in a, an area where you can at least get to some shade, that's going to do you a lot more favors. But uh, you want to make sure that 
get it gutted as quickly as possible. I I went on Amazon. I've been doing this for years, but I go on Amazon and I buy these really nice um, blue surgical gloves. I, I get like a hundred of them for ten bucks, and I put a big fistful of them in my hunting pack and just keep them in there. Um, you know, a lot of people just go at it with no gloves. I I happen to you know like to wear the surgical gloves when I'm doing the work, but you know that way once you're done gutting it, then you can whip those gloves off and your hands are still clean. So um, get your deer gutted. Get it, um, if you, if you're, well, I'm thinking two different things here, but since I do backpack hunting also. So if, if like most people, you're hunting whitetail or elk or muleys and you have access to get it back to civilization, well then gut it on the spot and then get it back home and get it, get it skinned. So now you've got it in the field, you've got it back home, whether it's on a tree, in your garage or where have you, but you've got it, the guts are out rinse out the body cavity and get the skin off. And then typically what I say is, is just quarter it. You know, and you know, there's a lot of people that are going to be listening to this that, that think this is, you know, this is simple information that everyone knows, but I want to make sure that, you know, for the sake of people that are listening and they're not familiar with breaking down their own animal, you know, you want to take off, you know, you want to quarter the animal. You got front leg, front shoulder, and then the opposite front leg, front shoulder, and then each of, the rear legs and the hips through the hip joint. So now you've got those four pieces, mm-hmm. but then you've also got, you've got your, um, you know, the head still connected to the spine and you, you can then take off the back straps and you've also got the tender lines on the inside of the rib cage. Um, and I was going to make one more point. Oh yeah. One more point. That's very, very important that if, if you hear someone talk about having really tough game meat, well, one of the things that happens when you harvest an animal, typically, especially, I mean, it happens to everything, whether it's fish, turkey, hooked animals, but um, a dead animal will go through rigor mortis, and that rigor mortis sets in in a matter of hours, and that's when all those muscles, you know, tighten up. Everyone knows what rigor mortis is. It's really, really stiff. Mm-hmm. Well, that rigor mortis will leave within the first 24 hours, typically, so if at all possible, you can certainly quarter the animal out right away, or you can let it hang depending on temperature. And everyone's opinions differ on this. I've I've hung deer for you know a week when I knew that uh, I was storing it at basically 34 degrees, and that's absolutely fine. It's just like dry aging, you know, any other kind of meat. But what happens is if you go out and you kill your deer and you start to butcher it. And you instantly start cut. You, you basically you're boning it out. Like I know a lot of backpacker, backpack hunters like to do. If you cut all the meat off the bone and you pack out the meat, what happens is those muscles will still go through rigor mortis. What they do is they bunch up really hard like a solid rubber ball, but then they don't ever fully relax. And so when you go to eat it later, you're like, man, this is the toughest deer I've ever had. Well, if you leave those muscles on the bone for 24 hours, a minimum of 24 hours, then they they tighten up real tight, but the bones hold the muscles in place. And then when they relax after about 24 hours, then those muscles are going to be much, much more tender when you go to prepare them. Yeah, that's actually that's that's great advice. That's uh what I actually, that's actually what I did with my my buck I had shot this year. I uh yep. hung it for I want to say it was three days. I hung it in my garage. Yep. The temperature was. Uh, it was probably a little higher than what we sh- what I should have been hanging at. It was about 45, 48 outside, and I had my garage door. I kept yep. to keep it cracked to let that cool air blowing in. I, and I also kept uh, ice packs, ice bags uh-huh. of ice in the cavity. Sure. To yep. keep it cool. Did you the, did you... Go ahead. Now, I did, uh, I, I, I think I may have made a mistake hearing you. I did have the skin on when I had, at that point, because I the, still had left the hide on, because my, my theory was, is I wanted to, that ice to get in there and that hide to kind of keep it cool from that ice expanding out, that coldness from the ice expanding out into it. You know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and that's absolutely fine. I've, I've, I've hung deer for several days with the hide on. Um, I don't think it makes a big difference either way. If the weather's warm, then yeah, you want to peel that, peel the animal as quick as you can and get it cooled down because the, that coat acts as a spectacular insulator and you're really never, you're not going to get it cooled off quick enough unless it's just really sub-zero weather outside. Um, and if you do, that brings up a good point. If you do go ahead and, uh, you get it gutted and then you get it skinned out right away, 
um, the the meat will develop develop what a lot of people call a rind. Basically, it just gets a little darker on the outside, and it almost looks like it's wrapped in a real tough cellophane. But then what you do is before you go to package it up and put it in your defreeze, you just got to get a sharp knife and just shave off the outer layer of uh, of the meat. It's, it's easy to do. Yeah, that was one thing because there was some areas of meat that, of the hams that were exposed from when I did do yep. my field dressing yep. that did get that uh, that what you're what you're describing on it. And it yep. was those things my wife was looking at it. She's like, "Is that still good?" Is it, it's like that looks like that's went bad. <laughs> and I'm like, smelling. Yeah. I'm like, it smells fine. I mean, I go by smell, yeah. I'm not judging anything, and it smells yep. good. So. <laughs> and what that does is once it de- it develops that 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 rind on there. And I think the the technical term I think is called a uh, pedicle or pellicle, but it, it forms that, that that tough outer skin and it also it almost becomes a barrier against bacteria and dirt and things of that nature and you're gonna shave it off anyway. So it's um, it's definitely not harmful and definitely isn't an indication that your meat's gone bad. Perfect. Perfect. Good to know. Like I said I never had no problems out of it eating it. Yeah. So once it's uh you know once you know you've got it, you brought it home You've either hung it or haven't hung it, but you've at least waited 24 hours before you start to remove the muscles from the bones. Now you got to decide, all right, how how am I going to want to utilize this? Am I just going to go ahead and do the the, ma- the major cuts and put it in my deep freeze or, or how you want to handle it? And so typically what I do is I'll have it broken down into quarters, and I'll just grab uh, an entire quarter, go, come into my house, and I'm I'm pretty fortunate to have a large enough uh, you know, granite countertop in my house. I can just drop it right on there, get out all my my uh, butchering utensils, which basically is just a couple, of, like a boning knife and a chef's knife, and uh, you know, start start uh, breaking it down. Now, you were talking about when you did yours that you know maybe you didn't do it right or maybe it wasn't pretty, but when I first started processing my own game, I just I I boiled it down in my own head to the fact that all right. I'm going to remove everything I don't want to eat, and then I'm going to make a pile of stuff I'm going to eat. So you're not going to eat the skin, the hair, the bones, the horns, the guts. You know, get all that stuff out, and then all you're left with is a pile of meat. So you can make, you can identify on 99% of the hoofed animals what looks like a roast. You got like the football roast and the hip, and you can, you know, there's if you eat a lot of roast, you know, you identify it, or you can chop it up into steaks. But there's really no wrong way to do it if you want to if you want to eat steaks you can separate those muscles and you can slice it across the grain and make steaks and then obviously whatever's left you can grind into uh you know your grind pile for tacos spaghetti chili whatever it is you want to eat yeah that was one of the things that that i felt was kind of intimidating and getting into it is is like i didn't want to utilize a piece I didn't want to utilize one section of meat for something that wasn't intended to be like you know you got your prop, your 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 roast cuts and your steak cuts and yeah and I was just worried that like of making the wrong decision I didn't want to like cook something that should have been ground and it had been terrible but <laughs> yeah <laughs> I actually uh, go ahead I, I I actually wanted to uh to to the way I I think I want to approach this this segment of this show with uh going over these cuts of meat is is let's is let's play a game in a way to where we, where we can visualize that we have this deer hanging right and you know yep. it's hanging out by its legs and you know head down and let's start at the top and work our way down on each cut and you can kind of give me a a new like a a unique way of pre- pre- preparing a dish from that section of the animal you know something that not your basic sure. you know your roast or your ground it you know something some some yeah. big dish you like to make cuz i know you get really creative you have a lot of watching your twitter feed you you take pride in what you cook and your it seems to me like you're always doing something different and unique that i'm not typically seeing out of what other people are doing with their game yep. And I would I would bet you that you've never seen me put anything up utilizing ground venison. No, because I almost yeah I almost don't grind anything. Um, like wild hogs, I grind quite a bit, and um, I'll keep some scraps from uh, from deer that I will grind into. Basically, what I do is when you know during the season whether I'm processing ducks and geese, turkeys, hogs, pronghorn antelope, whatever it is, I make bags of just 
scrap and I'll grind it all together and make it, you know, meatballs, meatloaf, you know, whatever. So I'll have five, six, seven different species of animals in my grind pile at, at some point because I, I typically, when I process a whitetail, I make steaks out of 99% of it. And if you prepare it right, they're, they're all spectacular. It's just like when they, when you process uh, a beef cow, um, you grind some of it if you want it specifically for grind. Other than that, you know, you can make steaks out of just about anything. So, you know, going back to uh, uh, the statement you made about what you would do if you're starting from the top and working way down. So we're going to assume that we're working with, what, like a hindquarter? Yeah, yeah, hind, hind, hindquarter first. Okay. So with a hindquarter, you, you've you got, obviously, your, your most meat and you know, I'm I'm not a butcher, would never claim to be, and I don't know that I've ever called a certain muscle by its proper, or either the butcher's term or an anatomical term. But <laughs> as as you're butchering it, it's very very easy to see the difference between this muscle and that muscle. So there are um, what a lot of people, and I think even in a lot of the, the wild game cookbooks, will call it the um, the football roast. That one is a really good size, shape, texture. It's fantastic for a roast if you're someone that likes to eat roasts. But I can also tell you, um, off one of the, the big buck I shot last year, I took that big roast and sliced it and made steaks out of it, and it was spectacular. It, it was, you wouldn't know it wasn't off a young doe. It was amazing. Really? So, yep. So you can, you can definitely, you can, when you think of a roast, it's not necessarily a specific muscle on the animal, but what it is typically is either a whole muscle or a large section of a whole muscle. So as you're breaking it down and you, you pull off a muscle that looks to you like, hey, this looks like a roast, then absolutely, if you're the type of person that likes to prepare a roast, that'd be perfect for it. Okay, and what's what's some some tips for uh, preparing a roast wild game to get the best to get the uh, the best preparation out of it? What's what's your pa- favorite roast preparation? Well, here's um, I think a lot of people have a tendency to um, look for recipes more so than they look for techniques because if you understand the right types of techniques, the recipe really doesn't matter. So let's say you've got a whole roast and you're going to make a roast. The number one thing most people do wrong is, you know, my mother, God bless her, couldn't cook to save her life. And she would throw some piece of poor, helpless piece of meat in the crock pot, put some carrots, potatoes, onions, add a bunch of water, put the lid on it, and let the thing boil like crazy while she's at work and we're at school. And you come home, everything tastes the same. It's all mushy. And I always wondered... How the hell can this meat be so dry if it was underwater all day long? I'm guilty of that. That's so, what I do with what? my with my roast. You know, it's it's roast uh, is a dish. Yeah, no. Roast is a dish that I always use for you know when I want my dinner to be ready when I get home. We'll throw a roast in the crock pot. Yep. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you, what I would recommend is first I'll tell you what you're trying to achieve, and then I'll tell you maybe some ways to achieve it. You don't ever, ever, ever. When you're cooking any kind of meat, whether it's shanks or whether it's a roast, you don't want the liquid that's in there to boil. Now, you talk about, you know, water boils at, you know, 210 or what, I don't, I don't know, whatever it boils at. But you, you want to bring it up just shy of a boil and just let it sim, just simmer. I mean, you're not even really looking for bubbles coming out of that liquid. You're just below the boiling point and that allows that will prevent that that dry that dry meat texture that so many people end up with when they make a roast. So what I do is um, I don't I use a Dutch oven. So if I'm uh, if I'm going to make a roast for like say you know Wednesday someday during the week, I'll make it on a weekend, put it in the fridge, and then warm it up. Because the only other way I've ever done that is put in a crock pot with a timer. You know, that way it only cooks for, say, three hours on low, you know, something like that. But um, like I said, I use a Dutch oven, and I cook my my meat and all the spices in the Dutch oven, and then I'll cook the vegetables 
separate. That way the vegetables aren't mushy. And, you know, when you, when you make a roast that traditional way, then the vegetables are overly mushy and everything just tastes the same. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, the big thing with roast is just, you don't want to boil it, bring it to a simmer. And, you know, depending on the cut, the animal, a lot of other areas, I can't give you an exact time frame, but typically if you're having, if you're having to cook it for more than two hours, three hours, maybe it, it that's, that's the exception. It, it, uh, if typically within two or three hours, it should be ready to go. So you're telling me that a roast isn't, doesn't take six or seven hours to make? So that's what the impression nope. I have life under is that is a six or seven hour process. <laughs> that's why it's crop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's one of those things that, you know, I grew up the same way, you know, whether it was crock pot, um, pot roast or whatever, you know, it just went in in the morning and you came home and it was done and technically it's done, but I promise you it was probably done before lunchtime. So are you, and, uh, are you paint, are you searing your roast off before you throw it in your Dutch oven? Very, very, very good point. And I know without getting too sciencey, uh, if that's, that's one of the reasons I do mine in the Dutch oven. So I get my Dutch oven, put some sort of, I, I like to, I'm a huge fan of bacon grease. And so I put bacon grease in it and get your roast and, um, I coat my roast in flour and then shake off as much as I can and then get your oil nice and hot or in my case bacon grease and then sear your roast pretty significantly. You don't want it to be just a little bit brown. You want to really sear it really good all over, and it has nothing to do with, quote-unquote, locking in the juices or anything like that. But, you know, the technical term is that my reaction. You want to get that brown all over it, and then once it's browned all over, take your roast out, set it on the pan side, and this is when you take your, you know, I don't want it to sound like a cooking show, but your maripot, which is like, carrot, onion, celery, and it's diced up, and you throw that in the pan along with a little bit of liquid, and that'll lift all that brown stuff off the bottom of your uh, your Dutch oven. Deglazing. Let that cook for just – exactly. There you go. Ready for your own cooking show. <laughs> so once you, know, once you get that done, then you put your roast back in there and then add – you don't want to cover it completely with water. Bring it up just like a half, no more than three-quarters. Um, if you have stock on hand, it's even better. But you can do it with just water if you want. Um, so bring the liquid up, you know, somewhere between half, three quarters, put the lid on it, and you want to watch it until it gets just to that simmering point, and then leave it alone. Uh, but you want to make sure you don't make the common mistake of, all right, it's just about to that simmering point with the lid off. And then you put the lid on, you come back 20 minutes later, and things rolling boil. You've already kind of, you've already kind of gone past the point of no return at that point. So I always, I turn my, my heat way down low because with a lid on it, that's probably about where you want to be. And then uh, I just come back about every hour with a couple of forks and just give it a little little poke and tug and see if that meat's starting to release. And once it's starting to release, I'll just take off the heat, let it sit there for, I don't know, 30, 40 minutes, and then you can either eat it or you can package it up for, for later. Now, this may be a stupid question. Uh, is this, this is all done on stovetop, right? You're not putting anything in the oven? No, nope, um, you can do either way with uh, a Dutch oven. I typically do mine on the stovetop. Um, I've also got an electric Dutch oven that obviously will go on the countertop. Um, it, I haven't noticed a difference. Um, one of my one of my nicer Dutch ovens has um, a handle on the top that says it's oven safe, but I've got my doubts, and so I typically uh, just use it on the on the stovetop. Okay. And, uh, it, I, I encourage everyone, and if you've butchered your own animal, you, you know what this is like. And um, when you're breaking down your animal and you've got the four legs, meaning the, the bone between the deer's ankle and elbow on what I call all four corners of the deer, the front mm-hmm. legs and the back legs, do you remember what you did with those last year with your butt? I think I, I cut the meat off and ground it. Right, and, and 99.9% of people do. And what you... Can and can end up with is you're eating your ground and every once in a while you got to kind of do that. You got a little piece of like unchewable sinew or gristle or it's just like my goodness, you know, I'm having to chew through a lot of this. And that stuff is also, especially from the forelimbs, is notorious for clogging up grinders. You got to take off the the front the 
face plate of the grinder and peel out the silver skin and start over. But what I did, and I, and I don't know if I was talking to you at the time, but this last New Year's Eve, um, I threw a, a wild game party, and uh, the star of the show was uh, Shanks that I'd saved from Whitetail over the year, over over this past thing year. And that's all it was was just uh, the four legs and behind the hind lower leg of a couple of deer, and it was a huge hit. Now, were you just when when preparing those? Were you uh, were were you cutting them and like leaving the bone in or on? Or were you cooking it whole with the bone on? How 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 was you preparing that? Um, I got um, and, and they're not very expensive for uh, for Christmas. I had received um, uh, I think an eighteen or a twenty two quart electric roaster, and so what I did was took those, left the bone on them, and just stacked them up in there like cordwood and so it was really full and I have my own stock that I've made I keep in the deep freeze so I put some stock in there and you know different herbs and and root vegetables and just this is one time when you know three hours for shanks is definitely not enough but you just let it simmer low and slow until you know the poke test says they're about ready and once that meat's about ready to fall off the bone then I just pull all the shanks out take all the meat off the bone so I've got a pile of the shank meat and then you can serve it, you know, however you want. It tastes just like amazing roast. You can have it like you would have roast, you know, in this particular scenario, I had made um, mashed Yukon gold with um, uh, marshmallow cheese and so basically like fancy mashed potatoes and it was, it was a huge hit. Hmm. Now, were you uh, using, were you making a, a sauce out of the, the braising liquid that was left over and using the, uh, utilizing that? Yep. That's absolutely what I did. Yep. I just, um, I, once I had all the meat and the bones out, then I strained all that through a strainer to make sure all I had was liquid. And, um, yeah, I had far more than I needed. So I probably took, you know, a quart, maybe two quarts of liquid and just reduced it and then thickened it a little bit. And it was, you know, just like that, that brown gravy mom used to make, grandma used to make. Mm hmm. Perfect. Yep. Sounds good. Now, did you utilize any of the, any of the innards on your deer last year? Uh, heart. heart and the liver. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do, I I do have a, uh, a tradition of every deer I shoot. I eat the heart the uh, the night of fresh. Uh, that's, I, yeah, that's great. We can do the same thing. Yep. Yeah, I just grill it. I, 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 I just grill it. I don't do anything fancy with it. I don't do anything crazy with it. I, uh, like I said, I just make sure I wash it pretty good and slice it and yeah. grill it. And probably, I'm sure there's probably ways to elevate that as well. Yeah, well, you know, it was, uh, it, people like what they like. I'm I'm one of those people that I, I I do my best whenever I start waxing poetically about food. You know, I've been cooking for 45 years, and, you know, there, there's – people like what they like. And if if fancy is what you like, that's great. And if you like it not fancy – because when I, when I make steaks, the only seasoning that I use is salt. If it's if 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 you're cooking it properly, that's all you need. So you know you were talking about how your your preparation for your heart was pretty simple. That's that's the best way to do it. I mean, if you've got a sometimes you have to take certain cuts of meat through a long process before it's edible, whether it's a roast or shanks or you know a neck meat, you know something like that. But you know my kids and my wife they fight over the heart, and typically I do the exact same thing. I core it. You know, take off any of the the fatty bits, and then slice it, and either grill it or fry it. One of the two, and that's one of their favorite things. Yeah, nobody else eats the heart around my house. Nobody, uh, nobody else will touch it. But uh, I, it's kind of weird. Uh, maybe I'm gonna, maybe I'm a little weird in this aspect. When it comes to the heart, like I feel like to me, when I'm eating that, that's my celebration, my my moment, my uh, I'm a celebration of that animal. You know, because I'm eating it the evening of, yeah. and I want it to be as raw not like raw cooked wise but i mean yeah. raw of an experience as it should be you know i i i, I yeah. want that irony taste that that you know you know you know what i mean is that making any yeah. sense like not I guess. I guess. yeah church it up and, and make it something that's not i want to know that i'm eating the heart of that animal i just shot today yep yeah we do the exact same thing i do my turkey too and um we eat <laughs> it's a funny story but we eat, definitely eat the heart out of the turkeys if I'm not a huge fan of liver, but wild turkey liver is amazing. I recommend that to everybody. 
So the wild turkey liver is awesome. Um, you know, we eat the heart, eat the gizzard. You know, we eat everything we can eat out of it. Maybe one day I will be able to try a wild turkey li- liver, but I gotta shoot one first. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm sure that this next year you'll probably get a whole boatload. Uh, I hope at least two. Maybe I'll make some, maybe I'll travel around the country and shooting birds next year. <laughs> Come to Kansas. I know we talked about now, it. I'm definitely considering it. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to Wisconsin yeah. for some whitetail hunting, and I, I I may be planning a trip out to Kansas for some turkey hunting. Hey, come on down. It'd be awesome. So as far as uh, you know, working on on working way down the deer. So from from the the hind quarter, there's there's definitely um, a couple of different roasts you can make, but you know uh, you can only eat so many roasts. So if you want to make steaks out of a large muscle, like I said, it's easy to identify the different muscles. You separate the muscle, lay it on your cutting board, find which way the muscle fibers are running, which is pretty simple. You can see where you know the the muscles connect at one end and it connects at the other end, which you you cut it crossways to those two connections. And you cut those things like your kind of steak, whether you like them one inches, two inches, however thick you like them, and slice those muscles into steak and uh them up put them in deep freeze. You so then you've got, you know, all the roasts you want and then, you know, for the rest of the the, the large muscle groups you can cut them cut them into steaks and you, or you can you can cube them up into stew meat. Uh you can also um uh if if you've you, as you're trimming them up you can you can take out your trim and that's gonna go into your grind pile. Um working your way up a little farther in the animal, you know, we, but I hope most hunters are familiar with when they talk about backstrap. It's, you know, the muzzle is, is you know, a little, little bigger than your, your wrist, your forearm that runs down the, each side of the spine. And what I, what I would encourage hunters to not do is to go ahead and cut the backstrap into individual stakes. Typically what I do is I cut them into about eight inch sections, you know, eight or eight or ten inch sections. That way you can cook them as an entire as one unit and then before you serve them you can slice them into individual steaks. It's so much easier to get the temperature right, whether you like them medium rare, medium rare. Yeah, that was a mistake that I definitely made was uh as I as I pre I did exactly what you said, I pre cut them all and packed them up individually. Yep. And that was a mistake because I've obviously learned since then that I should be cooking it whole, you know, searing it off whole, and then finishing the cook to the temperature you want. And how, t- how uh, what temperature do you normally cook yours to? Or do you like to eat yours rare, medium rare, well done? I hope not. Uh, I like it about medium, medium rare. I like it about the my I test is about the the, fe- the same feel as my thumb, the muscle on the inside of my thumb. I normally try to go for yep. that when I'm pressing on it, and then. Redder the better. I, I like it. I like it but red. My wife doesn't, so I gotta cook hers a little a little harder. But yeah, and you'll notice a lot of people that, that typically say that they don't like wild game or deer meat in particular is the more well done you make it, the more it's going to have that irony, minerally kind of aftertaste. The more you eat it towards you know the the rare to medium rare side, you're not going to have that. You're not going to have that metallic irony flavor to it that's that's interesting you it's kind of offshoot it's it's not necessarily wild game but it's a little tangent that you were talking about this so i want to kind of bring it up my wife when we first met she was adamant that she didn't like steak she doesn't eat steak she'll never eat a steak she doesn't <laughs> like steak, right yeah, yeah i come to find out i figured out the reason why when i i hope i know he doesn't listen to my podcast so i'm fine but when my father-in-law uh had cooked steaks on the grill one night we were over there for dinner i ate and it was like this is like eating shoe leather. He just freaking cooked, oh. cooked the shit out of these steaks, and they were so rough and tough. And uh, I, yeah. I told her after that, I'm like, okay, I'm going to cook you a steak, and you're going to eat it. And she's been eating it, my steak now for five years, and we eat it once a week. She loves steaks. You know, I cook it right, awesome. it's got medium, you know, nice and tender. And yep. And she's never she thought yep. she thought her life, whole life that's how steak was supposed to taste. That's steak. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Well, yeah, like I said, you know, my, you know, my mom grew up. She ruined me for all kinds of food. I think that's why I learned to cook when I was six years old. <laughs> I can't keep eating this woman's horrible cooking. 
Um, so now, uh, you know, as we're talking about different techniques uh, of cooking different cuts, and I know you've seen it, but I tell you, it, you've got to get yourself one of those sous vide machines. It, it's it's about eighty bucks, but I'm telling you, you you can make the most spectacular dishes using that thing, and you you will you'll be kicking yourself and buy one sooner. Yeah, I, I will check it out. What let's, let's explain to the to the listeners what what is what is the sous vide? What is, yeah. what is what is what is that process? So basically, all it is it's some French contraption. I mean, I've seen them on cooking shows my entire life, and they've always been thousands of dollars. And now you can buy them on Amazon for eighty bucks. And you basically get um, a large container that will hold water. Um, I bought a specific like a a Pyrex. Uh, I think it's like 12 quart container, and the 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 sous vide machine itself is basically just a submersible heater, almost like a fish tank heater on steroids, but it's programmable. So, uh, like a rare steak is like 128 degrees, medium rare is like 133. So, what you do is you put the you submerge the the sous vide unit into the water, you program it to the exact temperature you want, and it starts. And a little motor starts up, and it's it's like a little jacuzzi, a little jacuzzi that will maintain whatever temperature you set it at indefinitely. So if you take it, you know, a, a ten inch section of backstrap, you put it in a Ziploc bag, and you lower it down into the water, and it's getting, let's say that I want it medium rare. So I've got the temperature set at 132, 133, something like that, and depending on the thickness of the thickness of the steak. You let it go one hour, two hour. You really can't overcook it. So you let it go for a couple hours, and then once it's done, you remove the bag, you take the steak out of the bag, and then what I do is I get a cast iron skillet really hot, throw some butter in there, and then put the back strap in there, and literally 30 seconds, just really super hot, sear it all over the outside, get it nice and nice and caramely brown, and then take it off the heat, and slice it, and what you get, because, you know, sometimes you, you, when you cook a steak on the grill or on the, uh, on the stove top, it's really well done on the outside, and then as it works its way to the center, you're like, oh, well, I didn't quite get that done enough. So the inside is almost raw, the outside is overdone, and you've got this compromise. Well, when you make it in the sous vide, the entire steak is 130s from this edge all the way to the other edge. You start it real hot and quick. Then you've got just that little crust on the outside, and the entire steak all the way through is absolutely perfect. Wow! And it works on poultry. It it works on everything. I wish I wish I could make a commission on every one of these things that I could sell. I would. I'm not kidding. I would never <laughs> stop pimping them out. Well, if 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 Don, since you just talked everybody into it, if Don just talked you into Suvi and he said you could find it on Amazon, <laughs> then I actually do make a commission on stuff sold on Amazon. So go to the iHuntPodcast dot com first. And click on my Amazon banner, and then buy you your sous vide machine, and we all have a win win. <laughs> and I'll spell it for everyone because it, it doesn't sound, it's not spelled like it sounds. It's S O U S, and then the second word is V I D E. And, oh. and if anyone if anyone should happen to listen to this and go, you know what, I'm going to get one, they can hit me up directly and say, you know what, tell me again how to use this thing. And I've, I've made everything from pheasant antelope, whitetail, ducks, geese, you name it, I've made it in this thing, and it's always amazing. In fact, like I said, you can't overcook it. I actually did a venison roast for three days. What? I did. I swear. I, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to put this to the test. So I bagged it up. I put it in this thing for three days. Took it out, sliced it up, and it was it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> was, it, was it better, or is it about the same as it would have been at three hours? Um... It uh, it was definitely not necessary. I just wanted to <laughs> just just to see what would happen, you know, because it's in that sealed environment basically, so it can't, you know, it's not going to dry out. It's not not going to overcook. So it was just kind of a, a gimmicky little thing I tried. Hmm. All right, so uh, we touched on back straps. Now, when you're cooking your steaks, your your back straps. Now, is this is it just me, or or is this is this true? I uh, have noticed when I'm cooking over propane my steaks that it's it it adds a, a, a gamey element to your meat. Like it doesn't taste gamey. My meat doesn't taste gamey, but it gives it 
an off, like a gamey smell from using my gas. When I sear it or when I use charcoal, nothing. I don't, I don't get that. Is it, is that something that you've noticed or that you've heard or? Hmm. I haven't heard that. Uh, and I haven't noticed it. Um, I do typically use propane when I grill out, but I'll also say I almost never grill venison only because, um, you know, I sous vide it. And then, you know, when you, when it, if you're grilling a venison steak from the start, you I mean, you're taking it out of your fridge and you're going straight to the grill. You know, then once again, it's easy to run into that situation where it's overcooked on the outside and not cooked enough on the inside. So for me, you know, I sous vide it and then uh, I hit it in the cast iron skillet real quick and do it that way. But um, I don't know. I've never heard that. Now you've got, you've got me curious. I'm going to have to go and look into that and see if uh, if that's something that other people have experienced. Yeah, it's not, like I said, it doesn't do anything with change of taste at all. It's all like just a, an aroma of smell where you can definitely kind of smell the gaminess of the meat for, 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 for whatever reason. Like I said, it, it got it me to the point where my wife wouldn't eat it because of the way it smelled, even though it tastes like it. So I had to just... Yeah. I, most of my steak preparation with with uh this year has been all like pan seared over on the on the oven which which is a which i i like i've been came fond of that tactic anyway over over the grill yeah one of the reasons i like uh searing it off in the cast iron is because instead of just getting the grill marks and like we talked about earlier that maillard reaction you get that that uh that toasted caramelization of of the natural occurring proteins on on the meat then in a cast iron skillet, you have much more contact with the heat surface. So you can, you can brown the entire steak instead of just the parts that are hitting the grill grates on the grill. Right. Yeah. And, you know, the, you know, the brown is where the flavor comes from. Like you can eat a, a piece of regular bread and then you can eat a piece of toast right after it. And definitely the toast is that much better. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I think we touched on that a little bit. Let's let's move on. I got in my freezer right now the next thing I want to talk about that I haven't cooked yet. Ribs. That's, what are you doing with? Okay, ribs are. Well, first and foremost, I'm glad that you kept them. A lot of people just throw them in the garbage, or uh, at best case, they'll get that little sliver of meat between the ribs and throw it on the grind pile. With with whitetail ribs, and I'm sure that anyone's ever listened to Steve Rennell or Hank Shaw or any of the wild game cooks. They've they've already heard about venison fat being a tallow instead of a fat. So I'm not going to beat that dead horse completely to death. I'll bring it up again. But there's you want to trim off as much fat as you can from the ribs because uh, the tallow that is associated with whitetail it has a melting point that it's, I don't know the exact number, but it's much, much higher than the inside temperature of your mouth. So you take a bite and you think, wow, that's really delicious. And after about 30 seconds of chewing, it feels like you've been chewing on a candle because all that wax solidifies on your teeth and comes in your tongue and it's not, it's not, a, I think it's called steric acid. It's not a very enjoyable situation. So trim off as much fat as you can. And then a really good way to handle them is to parboil them, meaning you're going to boil them to the point where the meat is tender, but certainly not falling off the bone. And then you can take it out and throw it in your smoker, throw it on your grill, hit it with sauce, whatever, and finish it off that way. And what that's going to do is that not just the boiling, that's going to render off a lot of that fat. And uh, and just uh, once you're done, whether you're smoking them or grilling them, just serve them piping hot, and uh, they're really good. But like I said, you got to be prepared to work around uh, – uh, the high melting point of that white tail fat. Okay, so you where the boiling at first is that just to kind of help eliminate some of that fat that's on there? It, it definitely, it, yeah. You have a lot of that fat come to the top of the boiling water, and it'll work a lot of the fat off off of it. It'll also um, start to definitely tenderize the ribs because if you just throw them straight on the grill or straight in the smoker, you're probably never going to get them tender enough to chew. So I either Either parboil them or you can um, add some sort of moisture to them, wrap tightly in foil and do them low and slow in the oven. But, you know, for my money, I think I would just parboil them until they're, they're starting to get soft. I mean, it's, it, once again, it's going to depend on the animal, but um, once the, once they start to feel like, all right, 
these are getting close to edible, then you take them out and you can either hit them with sauce or you can throw them on the smoker, um, you know, whatever preparation you want to do. So they'll till, they still take smoke pretty good after they've been boiled? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this, and, and I've heard arguments that wet meat doesn't take up smoke as well as dry meat, but just from my my experience is um, I take it out and then, you know, blot it dry real good with paper towel or, you know, something that's going to dry off and then put it in the smoker because I haven't had great success with uh, wet meat taking up smoke. Okay, that's good. Good advice there. Good tip. Okay. I do a lot of, uh, I, I think you've seen, I do a lot of, you know, smoked waterfowl, so. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan, big time fan of smoking meat. I mean, that's, that's one of my favorite things to do on the weekend is if I'm, if it's the weekend, I'm finding something that I can smoke. Unfortunately, I haven't killed enough wild game to be smoking wild game every, every, every weekend, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, I've, I've been, I'm surprised at how many people I know that absolutely love to hunt, but I think their own, Lack of confidence in the kitchen has made them made it to where they don't enjoy wild game. So I've, I've literally during during waterfowl season here, I've had people back their pickup trucks up to my house and just throw off huge piles of ducks and geese because no one in their entire hunting party will it. And if you know how to cook it, my family, I make, I make a lot of Asian dishes using ducks and geese. Once again, using my sous vide machine most almost exclusively, and they absolutely love it. So start putting the word out to all your friends, the local to you, that hunt, because I think you might be amazed how many hunters give away their wild game. I I have a deep freeze that's almost always full. Really? And, and it's, I would say that at least 50% of it is stuff that's given to me. Because have, did you keep legs and thighs off your turkey? Oh, you didn't shoot turkey. Yeah, well, why you got to do that to me? <laughs> <laughs> I just, as soon as I said that, I, I, I was like, wow, that's wrong. <laughs> so most people most people don't keep the legs and thighs off their turkeys, and there's so much meat on there, you just got to know how to cook it. So Yeah, my buddy, actually, he has uh, – who, who he shot two, and he's still got his four uh, drumsticks in the freezer that he hasn't shot yet. He said he's going to give them to me because he said he don't want them. So I was like, well, sweet, I'll take them. I'll eat them. I'll figure out something to do with them. Does that, does that include the thighs? Uh, I, I I think he just cooked the breast and has everything else. So yeah, dude, if you if you can get the legs and thighs from him, yeah, get them. Then hit me up. I'll tell you how I I do it. And it's I make like these barbecue sliders. It, it's it's awesome. Okay, it's really really good. Yeah, yeah in fact, you could you can use your smoker if you want to. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> You know what's 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 funny is I just now got into charcoal grilling. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, literally probably three weeks ago. <laughs> you like it? Yeah, oh, dude, I love it. Like it, it's it's so weird because growing up my whole life, I thought that char when you cook something on charcoal, the flavor you got was lighter fluid. Oh really? Oh yeah. Yep. Me too. Yep. <laughs> and now it's like I I've been reading it in my uh, on how to actually reuse charcoal, you know, obviously that's, it's pretty basic shit. But I hadn't known yeah. about it, and I bought a little seventeen dollar charcoal grill, and I've been tearing that up a lot more than my uh, my gas grill, my hundred two hundred dollar gas grill sitting out there. So I'm that's left. great. I know I know a lot of people that absolutely love it and swear by it. It's one of those things that I've I've definitely done it extensively, but you know, as I get older and you know. You know, I know it, I'm preaching to the choir, but you know, you get kids and you know things happen. I'm like, you know what? I've got, I've got to try and streamline and maximize my time. So if I can just push the button and the heat comes up, that's a little more convenient for me. But I do still have uh, a charcoal grill and a charcoal smoker. I just don't typically use them as much as the propane. Yeah, week uh, weekdays is my is uh, now I have a, I have a schedule. Weekdays are my char is my gas grill. Weekends, yeah. I'm grilling. I'm using my charcoal. You know, I get. I like to soak. I've been gotten this thing of soaking some wood chips and throwing them in there on the charcoal and getting that smoke. Yeah. Using it. Oh, man, I'm just. I probably made some of the the best meat I've ever made in the last couple of weeks doing that. <laughs> That's awesome. That's I don't know great. if it's the best or if it's just because it's different. You know how that is. <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's it, and when you get to that point, like we talked about earlier, when um, especially when you're uh, when you're cooking wild game. If if you've been the only person involved in that process from the time that animal was alive and then processed and then deep freeze and then back to your charcoal and then onto the table, yeah, it doesn't matter if 
if technically you've ruined it once you're eating it, you're like, man, that's the best thing I've ever eaten. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter if, if, if you only have one process, one dish, one thing that you make with your game meat all year, you still, I think the feeling's probably the same. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's, I'm, you know, my wife is, she's the food Nazi. You know, there's, in our house, there's no high fructose corn syrup, you know, can't eat processed grains, you know, all this kind of crap. So, um, it's, it's good to know that, you know, we pretty much live, ex- live exclusively on, on wild protein. And, uh, it's, it's nice to know that that's what we're feeding our family and the fact that they love it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's that's a big accomplishment. Something you should be proud of. To be able to do that. I hope to get that to that point someday. Oh, you'll get there. Like I said, especially start you know start uh, some social networking with people that hunt around you, and you know you'll find people that you know. Hey, can you come show me how to break down this deer? And then you know here, take this quarter with you for your effort. And you know, it, I I've had people call me say we got four deer on the ground. You know, we don't want to take the process. Come show us how to do this. And I was stunned at how much stuff they're like, you know what, we just want some roast and then a pile to grind up and, you know, you have, you have all this stuff over here. And, <laughs> you know, like, like I said, all my friends that, that waterfowl hunt and he, I've never shot a duck or a goose in my life and I've probably got 30, 40 pounds of, of goose breast and duck breast in my freezer. Really? I've never, I've never yeah. shot a duck either. Uh, that's, it's actually funny because my next podcast next week I'm bringing on, uh, Dave Prophet from Fouled Up, and he's coming on to go yep. duck hunt, and he's going to go. He's going to teach me step one to to the end step on getting getting on some ducks this year. So, wait, well, I can definitely tell you how to cook them. Don't overcook them because <laughs> then they just taste like old liver. Yeah, you just want to you got to you got to render that fat really good and get that skin right, and then after that, it's yeah, it, yeah. And you know what? Once again, ninety nine percent. Well, hey. Most waterfowl hunters don't eat what they shoot, and the ones that do eat it typically just breast it out. Slice it this way, slice it this way, peel back the skin, pull the breast out. And what I do is completely, um, you know, defeather the entire breast and then breast it with the skin on. And if, if, with ducks and geese, you know, when I get to that point and I cut into there, first thing I do is look at how much fat is between that skin and the meat. Man, I tell you, if there's plenty of fat in there, it's like Christmas. Because I render that stuff off, and I keep it in the fridge. I've got duck fat, goose fat, pork fat. Oh, I'm a huge fan of fat. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, I, I think we're still kind of working our way down this deer that we have hanging out here in the garage. So uh, we we had got the down the ribs, got the back straps, got the hind legs. And I imagine we're we're treating the shoulders in the same, in the same way that we treated the the hind quarters. Yep, yeah, same way. And um, I, I think you might, a lot of people might be surprised when they break down their first year at um, the the disparity of mass between a hind quarter and a front quarter because a hind quarter has got a lot of meat and muscle on it. And, you know, the front shoulder, the, it, I mean, there's definitely meat on it, but there's not nearly as much meat. Um, and the anatomy is tricky the first couple of times you do it. A, hooved animals don't have a socket for their front shoulders the way they do in their hips. I mean, there's there's no there's no bone to cut through. There's no socket joint. Literally, you can articulate that leg and just run your knife right through it and take that quarter off. Yeah, it's amazing uh, how so little you, is holding that thing on. Yeah, it's, it's just muscles. That's all it is. And so you, you cut off the front quarter, and, you know, it, you can eliminate the foreleg because that's your shank, and then anything up higher than that, um, you know, the it can be argued that the front quarter works less intensely than the hind quarters. So, um, you know, it's a good place for, for steak, for, for steaks off the front. And I know that if you, if you're shooting elk or even a really big mule deer or a caribou, you can get the, um, basically like a flank steak or a, a blade steak off that front, uh, shoulder blade, um, off a white tail, it would have to be a massive white tail uh, in order to get uh, that particular steak off of there. Um, a lot of people choose to get their grind off the front. Um, you might you might get you know a, a steak or two off each side or a, a really small roast. But if you're someone that eats you know spaghetti, tacos, chili, um, you know anything that that requires ground meat, you know the front quarters are a really good place to get that from. 
Yeah, the uh, chili is about what I make with my grind meat. Uh, that and then meatloafs, different meatloafs. It's about it. I don't, I don't really yep. get into too much other than that with my ground meat. Well, and sausage. I will make, but I do make like to make my own sausage with it as well. Oh, awesome! Yep, we make a lot of sausage. Um, we also do, like I said, I do a lot of uh, meatballs. I get, I bought a muffin pan for mini muffins. I think it has like twenty four spots in it, and I'll take random duck goose antelope, white tail, wild boar, grind it all together, make, you know, 24 meatballs, put a ball in, put one ball in each of those little holders, and then put a little dollop of fat in each one, whether it's pork fat, duck fat, goose fat, and there, you should try it. It's spectacular with, with stuff that's basically going to be scraps anyway. Hmm. And you don't do any other season besides the fat? Um... Yeah, I'll put some sort of seasoning in it. You know, not a, not a lot. You know, typically, you know, some sort of you know garlic or a little bit of herbs or something. But that's about it. All right, and then what are we doing with the uh, with the neck the neck meat? The neck. That's what I was going to go to next. Um, depending on if you on your opinion of this and what part of the country you live in, if you have you know, CWD, chronic wasting disease, a lot of people get a little sketchy about spinal column and it's i encourage everyone to do their own research but you know there's never been a case where cwd has jumped the species barrier from you know from white tail to human beings but basically it's you know it's a wasting disease it's it's the 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 deer equivalent to mad cow disease so it's a it's a prion that can't be killed by cooking and it's associated with nerve tissue and brain tissue. So you definitely don't want to eat the, the brain out of a deer that's from a CWD area. And a lot of people are a little sketchy about cooking a whole neck roast because the spinal column is in it. I've eaten lots and lots of them and, you know, a lot of hunters have, but, you know, for, we'll just assume that it's, it's a clean deer and you can have your deer tested, but basically I cut the head off as close to the base of the skull as possible. And then, uh, sever it as far down onto uh, uh, onto the animal as you can. I mean, you've already removed the quarters and you've moved the back strap, so go down to the point where there's really no more meat. And you can either, I use like limb loppers and just cut that spine. You just kind of articulate it to where you can get the blades in between the, the vertebra and snap it. And mm-hmm. that's a great that's a great candidate for a low, slow roast either in the oven or, you know, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll smoke it at a moderate temperature, and this goes for any roast or ribs or anything, smoke it for, you know, an hour or two so it gets plenty of smoke in it, and then finish the roast preparation. That way it's got kind of that smoked meat flavor going on in the roast. So with the neck roast, just like any other roast, you can either do it in a a Dutch oven, you could do it in, it'd have to be a pretty large crock pot. Um, You can do it in your oven, just low and slow, however you like it, and then Wait until it pulls off the bone. Okay, so you you aren't deboning that then? How you leaving the bone in? I don't only because it's so difficult to work your way around all those vertebrae. So cook it bone in, and then obviously before you serve it, I, I use the old two fork method. Just kind of I I tease the meat away, and then you could just about lift that spinal column out on its own, and uh, you can discard that. And then you know, just for presentation, I always. Anytime I'm doing any sort of a pulled meat, I kind of pick through it, and if there's excess fat or something that might be off-putting, whether it's, you know, depending on if I'm serving it to, you know, my stepmom or my kids, if there's a, you know, a vein or something here, I'll clean it up that way. But, um, yeah, just basically pull it off the bone and throw the spine away, and you're good to go. I got gotcha. you. Now, what about, uh, what about the tongue? Yes, yeah, so I was going to say tongue. Yeah, tongue. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's... A lot of people's first instinct is trying to open their mouth, open the deer's mouth real wide and reach in there and get it. And they're, the the best way to do it, A, the jaw is probably going to be locked shut, but underneath the jaw, it, you'll see it's, it's, it's real soft. And you go back to the back of the jaw on one side, and you cut all the way to the front, and then go around and go all the way back to the other side. So basically you're just opening up underneath the jaw, and then the tongue will come out through the bottom there. And you can... You know, you might be surprised that you, know, you think of white tail's tongues, you know, four inches long and not very big. But if you get it all the way down to the base because it extends down, you know, to the top of their throat, then um, if what I typically do is save all of them until the end of the season, that way you can either you can pickle them 
or you can slow cook them. There's a lot of different ways you can do it. But the one thing to keep in mind is you'll um, you'll find a recipe that you like or, you know, a method or a preparation. But basically it's going to have to be almost like a braising or a boiling. It's going to have to be a wet method, so in liquid, and it's going to be low and slow. And then you have to either peel or shave off what you would consider to be like the taste buds because there's like a rough and, – and you'll know – it's easy to tell what you're peeling off. Basically, you can take a sharp knife and just shave off the exterior of the tongue and uh, eat it that way, unless you pickle it. You're doing that you before you – you're doing that after you cook it. You're picking off the taste buds. Yeah. Yeah, because it, that just makes it really easy. In fact, sometimes it just it, – you can just grab it with your finger and just peels right off. And it's just it's just a thin layer, uh, a thin, tough outer layer. And then uh, once you get to the inside, um, you can – Cut it up and eat it however you want. It's not it's not a large piece of meat. That's why I say you know save them. Save them for one popular uh, preparation that I've seen used tongues utilized for is uh, like tacos and stuff like that. Yep, and uh, it's I think the, the Mexican term is lingua. You you, you can uh, in fact you could put together some sort of liquid with a bunch of you know Mexican spices, you know cumin, some hot peppers. And uh, just let it simmer until it's soft, and then peel off that outside, and then slice it up and serve it on tacos with, you know, salsa and beans and whatever you like. It'd be great. Hmm. Well, I haven't saved a tongue yet, but I will. I, I think I'm going to do that this year. That's going to be my my next step. Yeah, up. yeah. I'm excited for you to get your next year and see what see what all you make with it. Yeah, I'm going to get a few this year. That's the plan, at least. Yeah, this is this is my wife's first year hunting. She shot a couple of turkeys, and then uh, I'm going to try and get her on. Uh, uh, some hogs and some whitetail this year. What made her decide to take the leap? Um, just wanting to be more responsible. It's hard to have. I work with a couple of girls that label themselves as vegetarians, and one of them is actually she's human about it. You can have a conversation, but you know, there's just no way to get through this world without negatively impacting wildlife. And if you go to the store and your only experience with your meat is that styrofoam tray with the cellophane over the top, it, I, I think it's not only is it irresponsible, I think you should – people that um, make an effort to not know where their food comes from, it's – it's disappointing to me. I mean, I don't want to want, I don't want to put off any of your listeners, and but it, it's it's one of my hot buttons. Cause if, it's like, they're, if they're listening to this, they know, they they know where their food comes from. Yeah, it's just like, man, you've got a responsibility. I mean, I I grew up absolutely loving animals, and I still love animals, and I have I have never in my life shot an animal and not instantly had that. You know, I feel bad, but. I've, I've got to feed my family meat. I have to feed, I have to eat meat. And I would rather that meat come from an animal that was happy and healthy and wild up until the split second I decided to take its life instead of an animal that was born into just sadness and pain and medication and, you know, just horrible, horrible situation and then fear and then it's killed and it's slaughtered with all these other ones and some nameless, faceless plant by some guy, you know, nameless, faceless dude, and then it's styrofoamed up and it's sitting in the store. I think that we owe it to the animal to face what we don't like. I don't enjoy the killing part of it. I really, really don't. But I enjoy giving my family healthy meat that was happy and healthy the way it was supposed to be. And then I, I promise you, if, if I was filthy rich and I could pay someone to do the processing, I'd probably do it. It's not my favorite thing to do. I mean, I don't hate it, but it's, you know, I don't necessarily want to get up at, you know, however dark 30 in the morning and freezing cold and go sit in a tree day after day and hope a deer comes out, shoot the deer, do all the work of gutting it and skinning it and dragging it home and hanging it up and breaking it down and packaging it. That's a lot of work. It's a lot that, of work. That, that, I, that not just me, but other hunters, all the hunters, you know, we choose to do it because it's the right thing to do. We're taking responsibility from the dealing the death and doing all the work up to and including preparing it and putting it on the table. Yeah, a lot of people on the out. A lot of people. Yeah, it was. It was good. I almost feel like <laughs> ended in it right there. But a lot of people do uh, do view uh, 
they view hunting as you know they they just see that instant of the animal being shot you know and, and it's it's understandable and, and me coming from somebody who you know I've went pretty much I went my whole life without ever hunting and without even thinking about it and, and you know there were times in my life where I looked on, on hunters with a negative with a negative tone you know because it's like oh you're killing an animal what what you know and I didn't understand then you know what I understand now and you know there's a lot of people out there who who they're just too busy to to even realize what they're doing and and realize realize what hunters go through and realize the actual sport until unless they were had somebody expose it to them you know so i think that's a lot of what we as hunters need to probably do a better job of when it comes to twitter and when it comes to these back and forth that you're seeing that you see people have with uh with a lot of the, the vegans and the leftists and the people who you know it's best sometimes to let that shit roll off your back you know and yeah. not, and, and not get into these heated debates because you like you said a lot of people you you can't convince them and yeah People are too busy to to. They'd rather just have that burger, be able to swing by that fast food, have that burger, have it ready for me. You know, yeah. I don't need to think about it. Yeah, that's funny. Um, my wife and I, we used to own an organic farm, and we, you know, we raised all these organic produce, and we 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 put up, you know, sauerkraut and tomatoes, and you know, we made all of our own stuff. But I didn't hunt, and I remember I was watching a hunting show one day. And someone sh- someone was bow hunting for deer, and they shot the deer, and it runs off. And I was like, oh, how, how can they do that? And then after a while, I was thinking, I was like, you know what? You know, I'm I'm a hypocrite because I'm I'm raising all my own vegetables and produce, and you know, we had goats and chickens, and I we processed chickens and ate and and, and you know, I ate goats, but you know, I've been uh, um, a hobbyist chef my entire life, and I got into hunting because I wanted not just the best, freshest, most amazing ingredients I can get, but I wanted to be responsible from it or be responsible for it from one end of the spectrum all the way to the other end. So I've seen both sides of it, you know, non hundred to hundred. All right. Well you we are over twenty minutes over an hour right now. <laughs> Ooh, that goes fast. Yeah, it went really fast. I got to wrap it up here. Uh, wife's in there waiting for me to get in and start cooking some dinner. So, what? Uh, All right. She's actually very really patient with me today. Let me record two podcasts, so I can't come. <laughs> yeah, my my crew is waiting on me to go to the swimming pool. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll let you go. You got any uh, final thoughts? Anything? Any final things you want to leave the listeners with? Uh, well, uh, you know, keep it on topic of the podcast uh, with regard to. Not just processing processing your own meat, but preparing your own meat is, you know, really there's not a wrong way. I mean, if don't be intimidated, you know, like you did, you know, find some videos or um, just do the old, you know, I don't want to eat the skin and the hair. I'm not going to eat the bone. I'm not going to eat the guts. Everything else, everything left is meat. You can slice it however you want. You this looks like a steak. This looks like a roast. We'll grind all the rest, and you just learn as you go. And every year you'll get better. So you know, just don't be intimidated. Yeah, and uh, step outside the box a little bit, and do try try something different than you're used to. Just, just yeah. see how it goes. Yeah. Live your and life. Buy a sous vide machine, and buy, buy a sous vide machine. Yeah, and buy it through my Amazon link. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, you take care. I appreciate you coming on. It was fun as always, and uh, like I said, we'll definitely do it again, man. You'll be a, you'll be a regular. You went from the first show to the twelfth. We've done right. a lot. Sweet. <laughs> All right, buddy. I'll talk to you later. All right. Later. Bye. Bye. All right, guys, that's it. That's the show. Thanks for listening. Thanks to Don Pratt for coming on. I uh, had a lot of fun. Uh, learned a lot, like always. Great guest, like always. If you would like to support the show, if you're loving the show and want to show your support, just uh, check out our Amazon link at www.theihuntpodcast.com. Uh, if you got anything you got to buy on Amazon, uh, please do so through that link and you'll be helping the show out. Yeah. Also check out give also check out Audible. Get your thirty day free trial through our link on our website. Um, that's it. Uh, this next week I have Dave Prophet from Fouled Up Waterfowlers coming on to talk about duck hunting. So I'm excited about that one. Should learn a lot. Until then, guys, take care. Bye.